From the virtual stage of the 92nd Street Y, hello and welcome to our civic series, Race to City Hall. My name is Seth Pinsky and I'm the CEO of the 92nd Street Y. I'm honored to be here to host these one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading mayoral candidates, covering topics of importance to all New Yorkers, including some suggested by members of our 92nd Street Y community. Thank you all so much for joining us. As we all know, the last year has been an incredibly difficult one for our city. To overcome our challenges, New York is gonna need a decisive, collaborative, and creative chief executive. It is for this reason that we at the 92nd Street Y have launched this series. Today, I'm speaking with mayoral candidate Fernando Mateo. Most recently, Mr. Mateo was the vice president of operations at Zona de Cuba, a restaurant in the South Bronx, and vice president at San Mateo Construction. He was also the founder and spokesman for the New York State Federation of Taxi Drivers and the United Bodegas of America. In the public sector, Mr. Mateo has served as a Westchester County Deputy Sheriff and on the Westchester County Police Board of Public Safety. Previously, Mr. Mateo served on the White House Presidential Scholars Commission under President Bush and as the Hispanic Director for Mayor Bloomberg's 2005 reelection campaign. Mr. Mateo, thank you so much for being here and talking with me. Thank you very much, Seth, for having me. It's an honor and I'm humbled by being here. Well, it's wonderful to have you. And uh, before diving into questions about your positions on various policies, I wanted to start as we always do just by asking how you and your family have been holding up during the pandemic. My family is supporting me 100%. I've got three kids, uh, a wife of 42 years, and they believe in whatever I believe in. And they've been supporting me 100%. And they're there for me every single day. That's cheering wonderful. Me on, cheering me on, like if I'm yeah. running a marathon. That's great. Well, I hope everyone has uh, stayed healthy and safe. Thank you. Um, so in anticipation of these conversations, we typically ask members of our community to send us questions that they'd like to hear answered by the various candidates. And before this conversation, several noted that you are the first Republican candidate uh, that we would be hosting. and then expressed varying opinions about the National Republican Party, um, which I guess isn't surprising because as we know in New York, registered Democrats far outnumber registered Republicans. Donald Trump in the last presidential election lost to Joe Biden by about 50 points here in New York City. But at the same time, New York also has a history of electing moderate Republicans to high office. We've elected Mayor Bloomberg uh, three times, uh, Rudy Giuliani when he was mayor, uh, George Pataki as governor. So I guess my, my question for you is this, how would you describe where you fit into the modern Republican party? Are you a Trump Republican? Is there another elected official at the city, state or national level that you feel better matches your politics? Can you introduce yourself to our viewers um, in, in that way? Sure, of course. Uh, Fernando Mateo is an urban Republican. And what is an urban Republican? An urban Republican is someone that grew up uh, in the city projects, uh, someone that comes from the inner cities of New York, and someone that knows the pain and suffering that our inner city communities go through every single day. The last 30 years I have spent working, supporting, advocating, and fighting for many different industries, all in the democratic city, and most of them being Democrats. And why did I have to do that? I had to do that because Democrats weren't doing it. I organized the New York State Federation of Taxi Drivers in 99 because they were killing 60 cab drivers a year. I organized the United Bodegas of America because they were killing, assaulting, looting, robbing bodega owners around the city for many, many decades. In 93, I did Operation Toys for Guns, and I got more guns off of the right hands, uh, more guns than anyone in the history of New York City. And in 89, I went to Rikers Island, and I spent three years there funding a program to teach train and employ first-time nonviolent offenders. 
And that is the kind of Republican that I am. I'm the kind of Republican that believes in economic independence. I believe in capitalism. I believe in the United States of America. My parents immigrated here in 1950. And I grew up here. And I was the lonely Republican since I was 18 years old in a very populated democratic city. And you know what? That did not deter my friends. That did, did not deter us from achieving our goals. At the contrary, it gave us the opportunity to share different opinions. And I was able to thrive because I was able to use what I learned as a kid. When I was 14 years old, I was adopted by a Jewish family. And they would pick me up in the morning and take me home at night after work. And they taught me the values of hard work. They taught me the values of what other communities are all about. They made me and they shaped me to be the person that I am today. I have worked very hard since the age of 14. At 17, I got married and I started my own carpet company. I went to flooring school, I learned to trade, I learned to skill. So I'm the kind of Republican that wants to empower our youth. I'm the kind of Republican that wants to make sure that every 14 to 18 year old kid in New York City has the opportunities that I had with the exception that I want them to stay in school, not drop out the way I did. I dropped out because the New York City school system failed me as a kid and I needed a way out. And this Jewish family adopted me and showed me the way out and led me in the right direction. So I wanna do the same. I wanna make sure that every 14 to 18 year old kid doesn't wind up at Rikers Island because they have nothing to do after school. I will work hard and endlessly to make sure that this age group finds a job at corporate America or at every and any city agency that the city has power over or at any small business that will hire them. We will give them tax breaks, but we need to stop the direction our city is going in. We need to stop poverty. We need to stop crime. And we start with our youth because every kid that's 14 years old and or 17, 18, 16, they're after school, they have nothing to do. They are lost in a city of concrete with nothing to do. I will make sure that they have that opportunity because it's the right opportunity. And I know that it will change the course of our city. We've got to start with them. Thank you for that. And, and there are a lot of directions um, that we can go uh, with that, that answer, but maybe the place to start um, would be to talk a little bit about jobs. And, and you talked about your desire to make sure that kids coming out of school have jobs. And, and clearly one of the major challenges that any mayor is going to face um, coming out of this pandemic is dealing with the significant negative impact that the pandemic has had on our economy. And the statistics, which I'm sure you know, are, are really devastating. The Wall Street Journal recently said that we're down about 600,000 private sector jobs versus where we were a year ago. Our unemployment rate is at about 13%, which is up from 4% pre-COVID. And as, as you also well know, the, the impacts haven't been felt equally um, with black and brown communities in particular being hard hit by the pandemic. So I guess as a starting place, what I'd like to ask is if you were elected mayor in November on your first day in office, what would be the three first policies that you would put into place to try to begin to address this economic calamity that we've faced? Zeth, we have faced not only, we faced two pandemics. We faced the first pandemic, which, which is Bill de Blasio. And we faced the second pandemic, which is COVID-19. Public safety is non-existent in our city anymore. We have no public safety. I don't feel safe walking the streets. I don't think you do, your family does. We need to get our public safety back in order. We need to bring law and order to New York City. We've got to give our police officers the respect that they deserve and the respect 
that they must have in order to bring the city under control. We need to make sure that our police officers respect the community they serve, and we need to make sure the community respects them. And I will not tolerate as mayor seeing our police officer being spat on, taunted, thrown water, buckets of water on. I will not tolerate that. There's no reason for that. Police officers are human beings like you and I. They go home after work to their families. But when they put on that uniform and that badge, they're out to protect us. They're out to make sure that we have a safe city. And I will work hand in hand with my police commissioner to make sure that we reform the police department, we re-educate the police department, but we have to make sure that our citizens know that there will be zero tolerance to disrespect to our law enforcement officers under the Mateo administration. It's uncalled for. Everyone has the right to protest. It's our, um, it's our constitutional right, but no one has the right to burn, loot, destroy, assault, rob, kill, murder our citizens. I've dealt with it for many years and I worked hand in hand with police officers to solve crimes on cab drivers. There was three weeks where they killed 12 cab drivers. And we, we stopped that. Bodega owners recently have been looted, assaulted, spat on, abused. These are small business people that come to our city to, to invest, to take a risk and thrive. Our police officers need to get our city back in order. And I will be the mayor, the law and order mayor, of course, with respect to our citizens, but respect to our officers. That's number one. A city is not a city without public safety. Number two is our economy and small business. I'm a small businessman. I, I created thousands of jobs in New York City over the last 45 years. I know how to create jobs. I know how to build businesses. I know what small businesses need in order to come into this, back into the city. I will recruit those that have left. I will encourage those that haven't been here. And I will make sure that they get the right tax incentives to come back to New York and invest in our city. The biggest problem that our risk takers have, and I know it firsthand, is our city agencies. How we are treated by the city agencies that we support with our taxes. I will reform and I will make sure that every city agency works with anyone that invests in New York, starting with the buildings department. It takes a year to get a permit to open up a, a 200 square foot retail sandwich shop to give you an idea, okay? In the meantime, that owner, that investor will go out of business before he gets the permits to operate. The health department, we need to work with them. The city of New York owns over 40 million rodents, rats. They own them, yet they blame everyone else for the rodent problem. We need to address that. It's a very serious issue. When you own a restaurant, when you own a supermarket, a bodega, a convenience store, rodents are everywhere. And regardless to how much a small business owner hires an exterminator, they will come because the city is not doing their job eliminating them. I will make sure that anyone that comes to this city and invests sees the light at the end of the tunnel. Most people invest and never see their investment back. I will make sure that these small businesses hire kids and teach kids the way I was taught. And I'll do that by giving them payroll tax breaks like Amazon was getting. They were getting $3 billion over 30 years for tax breaks on payroll taxes. I will do that, but I won't do it with 25,000 jobs. I'll do it with 50,000 new businesses and a half a million new jobs. I can do that because I, I know how to do it. Most of my, I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 finish, um, go ahead. Most of the people running for office have never held the public, a private sector job and they've never owned the business. So how are they gonna operate 
the largest city in the world. And thirdly, I think arts and culture. Arts and culture is so important because there is no big city, no successful city without the arts and without culture, without our theaters, without our businesses, our restaurants. I will offer a two hour or three hour free parking, at least for the first year or two, until we get back on our feet. For anyone coming into New York City, I would totally forget congested pricing. I would make sure that anyone that comes to New York to spend money at a theater, at a restaurant, at a small business, can at least park for free until we get our economy back. So, so let me ask um, this question, and I, and I want to come back to arts and culture. Actually, I want to come back to a couple of things that you, you mentioned. But um, with respect to um, the, the policies that you're outlining, uh, which is uh, pro-investment, pro-business, um, pro-public safety, uh, pro-police uh, position, a lot of those positions resonated at one point politically um, earlier in, in New York's history. It almost sounds like a Bloomberg or a Giuliani uh, type platform. Um, but the city seems in recent years to be moving in a different direction. And um, there are lots of candidates, uh, especially in the Democratic Party, talking about not investing more in the police, but investing less in the police. There are candidates who um, are talking about trying to reduce investment uh, and, and or to, to have less growth taking place um, because of concerns about displacement. We saw what happened with Amazon, which you referenced, Industry City in Brooklyn. So I, I guess politically, I mean, as if you're elected mayor, even if you're elected mayor, you're probably going to face a fairly liberal city council that you'll need to work through to get your policies enacted. How do you convince New Yorkers that this platform that you're describing is the right platform for us as a city? I will make sure that I work and I communicate with our city council. This is, New York City has always been a city where people come to achieve the American dream. New York City is not a socialist city. It's not a communist city. I think that the media portrays our city to be heading in that direction. I'm out on the streets every day and I don't see that. Every small businessman and woman in this city, most of them are immigrants. Immigrants come to, to New York hungry, wanting to become someone, wanting to achieve the American dream, wanting to succeed. They don't come to New York to sit at home and get a paycheck and get unemployment and PPP money and not go to work. Immigrants come to New York City to succeed. I am one of them. And the pulse that I have from most of these small businesses that I have visited and that I know and that I have known for over 45 years, they're all hungry to succeed. Of course, you will have the radicals, the AOCs. You will have that left wing thinking. You know what? People don't want to be given anything. People don't want freebies. People want to earn a living. New Yorkers are fighters. They're not beggars. We cannot accept that New York City is a socialist or a leftist city. There's a few radicals that are making a lot of noise. And there's a lot of media coverage that's covering them. I will be the mayor for all, but I want to take our inner cities out of poverty. I want to welcome back the rich. I want to engage the rich, the philanthropists, the foundations. I don't want to use taxpayer money unless I really have to. I want to engage those that give $100 million to Columbia to put up a branch or a floor in their hospital and put a plaque with their name on there. I want to engage them and say, why don't you adopt a city housing development so that we can change all the bathrooms and all the sinks? I know because I live there and the leaky roofs and the rodents and make their lives better. You need to engage those that have with the have nots in order to make this city a better city. We are not ignorant. 
We are not stupid. We need to have common sense and know that New York is the financial capital of the world. And if we let go of that, we will not have a city. There's enough here for everyone to live. There could be affordable housing. There could be housing for the homeless. I have a plan for the homeless that no one has thought about because everyone in this race is a politician and politicians don't think. Politicians have never worked. Politicians have never owned businesses. Politicians are bureaucrats in government that make our lives worse. We need to take government out of business because government does not know how to conduct business. And I am the guy to do that. And I want New Yorkers to have faith in this urban Republican because I will be there for the entire city. And I promise them that I will make the city a better place to live. You talked about um, affordable housing, which clearly is a major challenge, and, and you focused in particular on NYCHA. Um, you talked about how you had grown up in NYCHA. Um, clearly, the situation at NYCHA is disturbing. There are billions of dollars in deferred maintenance. Uh, the, the housing there is, in many cases, in terrible condition, and uh, it serves as home to for between 400 and 600,000 of our fellow New Yorkers. Um, based on your personal experience with NYCHA, what do you think are the problems? How did we get to where we are today? And what do you think we can do to solve that? You talked about maybe matching philanthropists with NYCHA, but what, what's kind of the big picture solution to this very serious problem that our city faces? It's a serious problem with easy solutions when you know and you're a doer and you can get things done. I would take NYCHA and I would make sure that we can bring the private sector to team up with the city and find a quick remedy to, uh, to repair. We spend billions of dollars, but we don't know how to manage those, that money. The, the government does not know how to manage or audit or make sure that things are getting done right. You hire contractors, enough contractors. You create business environments for the same people that came out of the projects, that are contractors, carpenters, plumbers. And you give them inspectors per site. And you give them duties that they need to do on a daily basis, goals that they need to accomplish and achieve. And you hold everyone accountable in the private sector to make sure that the public sector is doing their part. So I would make sure that we bring in the proper contractors, the proper philanthropists or foundations that wanna help the city of New York and the impoverished people that live in city housing and bring it and make their apartment state of the art. Make sure that they all have access to internet. That's not difficult. It's simple. It just has to get done. You need to have a mayor that understands business in order to cure this problem. And I will have a team of experts, of developers, of contractors that will be able to get this work done. And I will try to use as least the least amount of money, of taxpayer money to get it done. We have so many industrial parks in New York, in Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island. These Industrial parks are empty. You can take some of these sites and you can build permanent housing for the homeless because they need to live with dignity. Right now, the city is taking the homeless and placing them in communities that don't want them. So the homeless people feel unwanted and the community that they're in doesn't want them. So you put people at odds. We need to stop that. We have billions of dollars that we can take and buy land in industrial parks, put mental health facilities, food banks, bring mass transportation through there for those homeless people that have jobs or have kids that need to go to school. And you put them in an area where they feel comfortable because they have their own community and they feel like human beings for once in their life. That's what Mateo, the mayor, will do 
when I am sworn in. I will make sure that affordable housing is there for every New Yorker. How do you achieve that? By lowering and reassessing real estate taxes. You know, we blame greedy landlords. You know what? No. You know who the greedy people are? The mayors and the, and the city agencies that we have. Because we over assess a property, overtax them, and guess what? That landlord has to pass those tax hikes along to the tenants. So we need to reassess those taxes. We need to bring them down and cap them and make sure that the landlords pass those savings along to the retailers and to the tenants that are living there. That's how you get it done. So let me um, switch gears to a slightly different topic, but it's a related topic. Um, and specifically what I wanted to talk about for a couple of minutes is the budget. Um, there were some forecasts earlier that this year was going to be a budgetary disaster, but thanks to largesse in the recently passed federal stimulus bill, it looks like uh, the city's budget will actually be in pretty good shape for this year. But even if this year gets fixed, if you look at the mayor's January plan, he's projecting that there are gonna be roughly $4 billion a year budget gaps for as far as the projections go out, I think through fiscal year 2025. And a number of independent budget experts have looked at those numbers and have said, well, actually that $4 billion a year is based on a whole bunch of optimistic assumptions, probably gonna be closer to $5 billion a year. So those are big numbers. And then, you know, just listening to this conversation, you've talked about increasing the size of the police force, which would cost a substantial amount. You've talked about potentially lowering real estate taxes, giving free parking, all of which could be the right policy answers, but they come with price tags. So um, let's just say that, again, that you are elected in November and, and you sit down at your desk on the first day of January uh, next year, and your budget director comes in and says, bad news, it's, it's, it's just as ugly as everyone says, we've got these giant gaps and the policies that we wanna pass are gonna make them even bigger. How do you close those gaps? Are there some specific examples of either costs that you think could be cut or revenues that you think that we could secure to help to balance the budget? Well, first of all, we need to know that Bill de Blasio increased spending in New York City by billions of dollars. So we would revisit and we would audit every city agency and make sure that we get the spending under control where it should be, not where it's at right now. There's a lot of fat that needs to be shaved. So I think that right there, you can save a few billion dollars because he has gone out of what he's He's out of whack. He's, you know, spend and spend and spend and create problems. When I am mayor of New York City, I will communicate. I will have great communication skills and I will communicate with the federal government. And if we need federal assistance, we will get federal assistance. But I'm also thinking of creating and bringing in a half million more jobs, a half million more people paying taxes to New York City. So although we're reducing taxes in some areas, we're increasing our tax revenue in other areas. There's a lot that can be done in New York City and a lot of areas that you can be creative with and, and bring in tax revenues. But we don't need to raise taxes and drive people away. Right now, the biggest problem that I think we will be facing is stopping the exodus from New York City. The rich are leaving because there are too many rich haters in New York City. We need to engage those that have money and engage them to make sure that we can use them in order to bring our city back economically. I believe there's also, you create debt in order to raise money. There's a lot of, the, the city can put out bonds for different programs and different projects in New York City like roads, our roads are falling apart. You can't drive a luxury car in New York anymore. Every time you hit a pothole, you blow your rim. You know, there are more holes and more problems with our infrastructure than anything else. So 
you create debt by selling bonds and repairing our roads and create income from those new jobs that you're creating. I'm a job creator. I know how to create and make money. I just, my wife opened a restaurant in, in the South Bronx, okay? On top of a rooftop. We employ over a hundred people from the community, all paying taxes. We generate a lot of money for New York City. But guess what? Every city agency is our enemy. Every city agency torments you, tortures you every single day. Every small business that you walk into in New York City, you ask them, what is your biggest fear? And it's not the pandemic. It's not the economy. It's the city agencies that walk in there and want to fine you through the kazoo in order to bring money into the city coffers. You know, the horse and carriages on Central Park, I would support them. They're, they are a fabric of New York City. They are small businesses. The taxi industry, every taxi driver, they don't work for Uber or Lyft. They work for themselves. They invest their money in buying a car and that car is their business. So how are we going to continue to tax them and lose ridership? So the first thing we need to do, public safety, and then bring businesses. I will reach out to every major city in the world. And I will tell them, New York City is open for business. New York City wants your business. New York City will help expedite your businesses so that they can open quickly and you can hire people quickly. We will make New York City the financial capital of the world once again. I will not allow for JetBlue to leave New York. I will not allow for the Wall Street Stock Exchange to leave New York. I will stop the exodus. I will welcome the developers back to New York because we need them to build housing. We need them to bring jobs in, in, into our economy. I will work very hard to make sure that we balance our budget and that we can live with what we have. That's the mind of a business person. You don't spend more than what you have. You budget properly. You don't spend what you don't have. And that's what we have had the last seven years. And that's gonna stop when I am mayor. Let me um, pick up on, on a discussion that we had earlier about another sector. You alluded to the importance of arts and culture um, in any recovery. And um, by any measure, the pandemic has been really devastating on the arts and culture sector here in New York. I think the statistics are that last year at the in the depths of the pandemic, the city had lost something like 20% of all jobs. And then over the course of the rest of the year, about 30% of that 20% came back. Whereas in the arts and culture sector, we lost something like 68% of all jobs and only 5% of them came back. But I guess, um, you know, one of the things that's clear from the conversation that you and I are having, New York faces a lot of different crises at the same time. We we're facing increases in crime, we're facing um, increases in, in homelessness and housing insecurity. And so a question that I'd like to ask you is, can you give a little more color around the point that you were making about why at this moment, given all of our other challenges, we should be prioritizing arts and culture. All our tourists and everyone that comes to New York City comes to New York City for the arts and the culture. Arts and culture are just or more important than any small business in New York because the small businesses in New York feed feed by the traffic that the arts and cultures bring. Listen, COVID hit us hard. We all know that, but we know who the vulnerable people are. We know who we need to protect. We need to protect the seniors. We need to protect people in nursing homes. We need to protect people with underlying conditions. We need to reopen our theaters ASAP. We need to open, get all those restaurants that left that Times Square area, the theater district, to reopen once again. We have a bigger problem. Once again, the Democrats increased unemployment along with PPP. So as our city's economy is starting to reopen, 
No one wants to come back to work because they're making more money sitting home than if they were working. So it's got to be a balance. As we open up our industries, as we open up our theaters, which we so desperately need, we also need to open up our restaurants and the businesses around that feed from this industry so that tourists know what to do before and after a Broadway play. We need to make sure that our city parks are used for the arts and the culture. They're not being used for that. And I believe that that's what parks and recreation should be. It should be tied into arts and culture. I will work with people like Luis Miranda that are brilliant and can help with this issue, okay? That can help with bringing back the arts and the culture. I would make sure that our jails, Rikers Island, I will not close it. I would reform it and I will make it a rehabilitation center so that kids that are 16 to 18 to 21 that are locked up for a year or two can see what the arts and culture life is all about by building cultural centers in the jail system. I would make sure that the city housing projects, they have a lot of land around them that's underutilized. I would build cultural and community centers within the city housing projects so that those people have the same opportunity as wealthy people to see a play from a school or enjoy a, 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 a philharmonic or enjoy music or concerts. We need to engage the arts and cultural community more than ever because, with, because without arts and culture, we have no city. It goes hand in hand. And I believe in that because it's the driving force behind New York City's economy. I believe they bought in over $110 billion into our economy in New York City. And I, don't, I wouldn't understand why any mayoral candidate would not do what I am proposing. But when I am mayor, I'm not just gonna propose it or speak about it. I'm gonna make it happen. And if every cultural and arts center has the name of a foundation, of a rich family, of a philanthropist, I will welcome that as well. Because once again, we're not using taxpayer dollars to, to build these things. I was speaking to a billionaire a few days ago and he told me, I just wrote a check, a hundred million dollar check to Columbia so that they can put a, a, a plaque or a wing. I said, why didn't you save that until I'm mayor and then you can, we can put your name on in front of a city housing development that you helped redevelop and, and, and helps thousands of poor families live a decent life. So I will be the mayor that communicates. I'm not afraid to ask. I'm not afraid to stretch my hand. The mayor has a lot of power. And when the mayor calls, everyone picks up the phone. And I will use my power to make sure that I engage those that can help the city progress and move forward. I will reach out to the arts and science gurus. I will reach out to homeless experts. I will make sure I have the strongest administration this city has ever seen. But it's only because I've experienced most of what we're talking about. Most of these other candidates haven't experienced what I have. And that's the difference between Fernando Mateo and every other one of the candidates that are running for mayor. And um before we, we close, um, I want to make sure to touch on another um, area that, that you described earlier, you had personal experience with. Um, and it relates to another topic that a number of our patrons um, asked about, which is um, public education. Um, and uh, the public education system in New York is another critical area for um, our future. The system is educating 1.1 million students. Um, the kids in the system range from children from high functioning households to children from some of the most challenged households anywhere uh, in the world. Um, and obviously all of the problems that the system has been facing have only been exasperated um, by everything that has happened uh, over the course of the last year with the pandemic. Now, what I, 
found interesting as I was reading through um, some of the conversations that you've had is that you've come out with a very interesting set of proposals um, on public education. And what I found most striking about them is that it seems that there are elements within your proposal that will both please and disappoint almost every camp um, of the many camps that are in the, the public education debate. Um, so for example, you call for a longer school day, but you also call for more time for professional development and planning for teachers. Um, you call for more public school choice, but you also talk about bringing down teacher-student ratios. Um, so could you just take a, a few minutes in, in the few minutes that we have remaining to talk about your public school platform? My public school experience, and I'm glad you touched upon that, was a terrible one. Going to public school to me was, was a very bad experience. And that's why I dropped out at 14 in the ninth grade at Seward Park High School in, in Manhattan. The drugs that were being sold in school was every other classroom. The bullying, the intimidation was beyond my comprehension. I believe that New York City public schools need to change drastically. If you go to any third world country, how do you identify a New York a, a student that's going to school. Even in Haiti, one of the poorest countries in the world, you identify them because they're all dressed the same. They all go to school looking the same. New York City, some kids wear $1,000 coats. Others wear $2 coats. Some wear $300 sneakers. Others wear $2 sneakers. And that is very intimidating to those kids that cannot keep up. And it's also intimidating to those that have it because they get robbed. I've spoken to many parents that say, my kid came home today barefooted. They stole his sneakers or they stole his coat. Why should kids be subject to that when they're going to school? I would advocate for making sure that every public school student goes to school in a uniform. I believe Catholic schools, private schools, a lot of charter schools implement this because it creates a culture of learning. And that's what you want. Some people will hate me for it, some people will not. I am not going to be everything to everyone. I believe in what my experiences were and what I see and what I read every single day. The public school system is controlled and driven by the union, by the teachers union. The city schools belongs to the city, to the mayor. He is the leader. He is the guy that says what can be done and what should be done, not the unions. We need to stop this nonsense. We've got great teachers with let little support. We have, you know, I want to give parents the option to send their kids with a voucher to whatever schools they feel the kid needs to go to. There are a lot of kids that are not going to school anymore. Last I read, I think it was 40,000 kids that are not going to school. Why? Because if you feel afraid to go to school, you're not going to go. If you feel intimidated or bullied, you're not going to go. So there are certain kids that their parents know they're going through pain and suffering every day just to go to school. Why should we allow that? Why not allow a parent who has their children? That's all they have. I work for my kids. I have three kids. One's a doctor. My youngest daughter's a doctor. My middle daughter's a published writer. My son it works for sanitation. And he's in arts and culture. He's a, he's a starving actor. Okay. Listen, I want the best for my kids, but I want the best for every New Yorker's kids as well. If you choose to send your kids to public school, you have a voucher to do that. If you want to send them to charter school or Catholic school or yeshiva or wherever, you will have that option. 
under my administration. Will that piss some people off? Yes, it will. But guess what? I just want to make sure that I do the right thing. And that when I go to sleep at night, I know that I've done the right thing for those parents and for those children and for those kids. Because I don't want for the pain and suffering that I went through for them to go through. Maybe if I would have graduated high school, maybe if I would have gone to college, I would have been something much bigger than what I am today. But you know what? I did not because the school system failed me. I don't want our school system to fail any New Yorkers and I will work very hard for that. And I want people to know that Fernando Mateo is not angry. I am passionate. I feel passion for my city, for the city that made me who I am, for the city that gave me everything I have. And six months ago, I had a choice. I would move to Florida and live happily ever after, or I would stay in New York and I would grind it with New Yorkers, with the immigrants, with the small business owners, with the risk takers, with the rich, with the poor, with everyone, okay? And that's what I decided to do. So I'm hoping that everyone that's watching this interview goes to MateoTheMayor.com and supports me and chips in and allows me to do what I need to get done to take our city out of where it is because no other candidate has the experience, the know-how to do it. Well, thank you for that very passionate answer and all of your very passionate answers. There, there's so much more uh, that we could discuss, but unfortunately, we're out of time. So I wanted to just express my appreciation to you for sharing your many plans with this, for the city with us. Um, I also want to say to our 92nd Street Y patrons, thank you for supporting and tuning in to the race to City Hall. Please check back on our website for the most up-to-date schedule of future conversations. And in the meantime, from the virtual stage of the 92nd Street Y, we're signing off. We appreciate your joining us. Thank you. Thank you.